Hi, everyone, and welcome back to the Building Technology Podcast. This is your host, Scott Holstein, and today I'm joined by our guest, Gregory Patton, founder and CEO of Sustainable Consulting Group. Gregory is a 20-year veteran in the commercial real estate space. Gregory began his journey as an apprentice engineer in the early 2000s with CBRE in Miami, Florida. Determined to learn everything about commercial real estate operations, he slowly worked his way through the ranks and became a chief operating engineer. Having always excelled at operating properties efficiently, the transition into sustainability was an easy one. In 2016, he began earning his credentials and is a lead AP for operations and maintenance, a lead AP for interior design and construction, a well AP, and a fitwell ambassador. Today, Gregory runs Sustainable Consulting Group, a Denver, Colorado-based national sustainability consulting firm. How are you doing, Greg? Welcome to the podcast. Doing well, Scott. Thanks for having me on today. Appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I've, I've always kind of looked at you as a, um, an authority on the topic of sustainability. And um, today, you know, being that we're going to be talking about the business case for healthy and sustainable buildings, uh, I don't know that we could have a better guest. So very happy to have you. And, you know, reading your bio there, uh, obviously, you come up through the ranks of commercial real estate and building operations. Um, But tell us a little bit more about Sustainable Consulting Group and what you guys are doing today. Yeah, thanks for the uh, thanks for the the great intro. And it's kind of neat to be starting to get recognized as an authority in this in this field. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. So Sustainable Consulting Group, we are a, a full service national sustainability consulting firm headquartered out of Denver, Colorado, uh, but we do work nationally. So Sustainable Consulting Group, we do, uh, you know, given my, my background, like you said, in operations and maintenance and coming up through the ranks, a lot of existing building uh, certifications. So different types of green building certifications, if you will, lead, lead project management, healthy building certifications, your wells, your fit wells. And then we also offer uh, several different other engineering services, if you will, you know, ASH, ASHRAE energy assessments, building commissioning, Energy Star portfolio management review, and then also a bunch of construction related services that, that deal with sustainability. Okay, great. And I uh, imagine now that uh, the the healthy part of this, the healthy buildings, is a huge part of uh, what people are looking for in these kinds of assessments. Is that was it? Would that be an accurate guess? Yeah, I mean that that is one side of the assessments. But you know, it, it's unfortunate, you know, given our current situation with COVID, that kind of brought to light how how important that healthy buildings are and the role that they play in the everyday life of of people in the buildings. So yeah, it's definitely a hot topic right now, with everything that's going on in the world, COVID. Absolutely. So today uh, we're going to talk about the business case for healthy, sustainable buildings and beyond the fact that it's just the right thing to do for your building occupants and everybody involved. We're going to discuss you know, where it makes sense on the bottom line as well. So to get started, when we're talking about the business case for healthy, sustainable buildings, let's talk about what it means before getting into the details. So what kind of buildings are we talking about and what makes a building profitable or successful? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, really, the, you, you can make a business case for any type of, of building, anything within the built environment. You know, it, it's going to be better for the bottom line of the ownership to have a sustainable building. So so anybody that works within the realm of commercial real estate is is what we're going to be talking about with healthy and sustainable buildings. So, Greg, because healthy buildings are a hot topic right now, let's start there. Can you give our listeners an overview of what makes a building, quote unquote, healthy and why this should be attractive to building owners and operators? Yeah, there's so many different types of uh, certifications out there for healthy buildings. Most of them are going to focus on on what is the built environment doing to promote the health and wellness of the occupants inside of it. So, you know, they're going to focus on things like indoor air quality, obviously, which is a big hot topic right now with healthy buildings. But but then, you know, you get into the the acoustics of the building, the water quality of the building, the, the light levels in the building. Do you, do you have views to to natural habitats? Is is the, the ownership and the management company promoting a healthy lifestyle? Are they trying to promote what type of snacks do they have available for the occupants? If there's a cafeteria on site, do they have engineering controls in place to m- promote the fruits and vegetables rather than an occupant goes for a break and grabs a bag of chips or something like that? Are stairwells accessible and able to be used by the occupants to travel between the floors? Interesting. So, yeah, when I think of a healthy building, 
you know, coming from a controls background, I, I of course think of indoor air quality. So good information, knowing that there's so much more to that than uh, than just the quality of the air or the environment um, of the building itself. So what about providing that that healthy building and all of those healthy options should be attractive to building owners and operators? I mean, bottom line is going to have tenant retention. If you have a, a healthy space, you have healthy people inside of it, you're going to have a healthy bottom line. And with ownerships, it, it all comes back to the bottom line. If the building is profitable and the occupants are happy and, and the tenants are renewing, it's, it's going to be better for, for the ownership and for the management companies that are involved running the buildings. And that is certainly something I think most of our facility manager listeners out there can relate to. Uh, everybody's asking them, you know, what kind of filters they're using. And so many people are hyper aware of the air they breathe and everything that they do now. People are doing their research. So you better you better be on top of it. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's, it, it's exciting to see that tenants are becoming more educated and asking more questions, not only of the occupants, but then, but then the occupants come to consultants like us and say, what should we be doing to get these tenants safe back into the building once everything is back to quote unquote normal and they're allowed back in the building. So it's definitely an exciting thing to see within the industry, the way that it's moving right now. Right. And like you mentioned at the beginning, it's something that has been brought to light only recently in, in commercial real estate in particular, really the only place where you saw a focus or one of the places I saw a focus on indoor air quality and having, making sure that the building is, is quote unquote healthy is in healthcare facilities and, you know, very uh, critical environments, I'd say. But on the sustainability side of this, my first thought of sustainability is energy efficiency and the savings associated with it. But is sustainability more than just that? You know, coming from my operations background, I I was always very fortunate in my early part of my career to have good chief engineers above me who really pushed and taught how important energy efficiency was. So my very first thought of sustainable buildings, you know, even before I thought maybe sustainable was a word in commercial real estate was the energy efficiency portion of buildings. But, you know, I I, kind of look at sustainability holistically, you know, not only like you say the the energy efficiency portion of it, but then also this other topic, the healthy buildings. So beyond the cost savings, how does operating a more sustainable building benefit building owners and operators? Is it similar to that of a healthy building? Is it just tenants are more aware of this now and it's more attractive because of it? Yeah, that's a great question. There's there's been a lot of reports pushed out lately about the uh, what the market is demanding right now. So we are definitely seeing a lot more demand for sustainable and healthy buildings. Just given the, the, you know, the current situation with COVID, the sustainable practices more in the market. JL has what they call their 330-300 rule, where every $3 spent on utilities, $30 is spent on rent, and $300 is spent on an employee retention per square foot. So it only makes sense that these companies are becoming more aware, especially, you know, as, as we get the younger generation, the millennials, we're demanding healthier buildings, more sustainable buildings. We're really seeing a big push in the market for it right now. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And one of the areas, you know, you mentioned uh, is the energy efficiency paired with healthy buildings. So one of the things that we've seen a lot with uh, with our customers at CompuTrolls is there's a balance there. So you have uh, indoor air quality being such a focus to achieve that level of indoor air quality, oftentimes it requires more air changes, requires uh, filters that are going to going to generate a, a bigger pressure drop. And so it's a it's kind of a balancing act of, okay, I, now, now my priority, rather than running this building as efficiently as possible, is first, safety and health. Have you talked to a lot of building engineers right now who are struggling with that? I've had a few conversations, you know, when, when COVID first hit last year and everything started shutting down, you know, my, myself and, and colleagues were kind of scrambling because a lot of clients were coming to us saying, what, what should we do? What protocol should we be following? So it, it's, it's good. It is, like you said, it is a fine line to walk and there, there's always going to be trade-offs with everything. And honestly, Scott, I mean, you know, all this stuff and all, all the new, the new data that's coming out and the new protocols, it's, it's, is really stuff that that we should have been doing all along. I mean, n- none of this stuff is is new. It's, it's new around COVID, but you know, all, all these different types of in, indoor air quality checks and everything that we're measuring, 
is not only good for COVID, it's, it's really good for any type of airborne thing that's, that's in the air. A building engineer, a facility operator has, has the ability to, to step up and, and make their facility more healthy. It's all going to go back to the bottom line. You may trade off a, a penny or a dollar here or there on your utility cost, but can you put a price tag on keeping a, a tenant in the building for another 10, 15, 20 years? I, I think the, the cost of changing out filters or, or implementing any of these other strategies, engineering controls that are out there are going to far outweigh the, the, the utility costs. Beyond the healthy and sustainable portion of, uh, of what we're talking about, I think that this kind of falls in somewhere in the middle of there. One of the things I'm hearing a lot about is metrics now that they're able to put in place that measure productivity. And they're saying, you know, look, under the right conditions, under the right temperature, you know, with more natural light, with, uh, you know, with more fresh air, et cetera, people are actually happier and more productive. And I guess what I want to know from you is, is that something that, I mean, I understand that studies are able to quantify it. It's probably not very easy, easily quantifiable for most building operators or even the tenants who are looking for that. But is that something that is, you know, another factor in terms of, okay, they're providing an environment where my employees can be more productive now? Is that something that's getting more attention? Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's that's kind of the backbone of the healthy building movement. You know, you have healthy people in healthy buildings, you're going to have a healthy economy. So th there are definitely a lot of studies out there that put numbers to what you spoke of, but, you know, kind of each project varies from project to project. And one of the things I noticed, you know, if you guys don't already follow Greg on LinkedIn or you're not connected with him, I would recommend going there. He posts a lot of really great stuff. But one of the things I noticed is he's got a lot of letters behind his name and I'm not sure what they all mean. So, uh, you know, I, there are a lot of building certifications around sustainable and now healthy buildings. Some of the ones I've heard of are Energy Star, Lead, Fitwell, uh, Well. Uh, can you tell us more about these certifications and how buildings are incentivized to achieve them? Yeah, definitely. I, I, I do have a lot of acronyms after my name. I had to create a whole other signature line just, just to fit them all there. But yeah, so like, like you said in the beginning, I'm a, a, a lead AP, uh, which is a lead accredited professional for operations and maintenance, also a lead AP for interior design and construction, and then, you know, covering the healthy building portion side, I'm a well AP and also a fit well ambassador. So yeah, you, me you mentioned pretty much the big ones, Energy Star, Lead, Fit Well, Well. There, there's a bunch of other ones that out there that have come to the market, like Green Globes, Boma 360. They're, they're all really good certifications. Typically, I just like to, when, 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 I'm, when I'm speaking with the client, trying to get their, their sustainability goals, you know, the bottom line is, what are you trying to achieve? You know, if, you, if you're going for, for pure energy efficiency, Energy Star is, is a great place to start if you don't have a huge budget. Energy Star is, you know, portfolio manager is a free service through the, through the EPA. It does require some site visits from an engineer and a, a, sealed, and, a sealed and stamped energy performance data from an engineer. But that, that's a really good place to start. Obviously, everybody knows LEED. It's, it's almost four-letter dirty word, word where nobody wants to say it, but everybody knows they have to do it. And then the healthy building portion really started gaining traction a couple years ago. Well was released, I think, back in 2016 after years of, of science-backed data from the International Well Building Institute. They launched their pilot program. Um, it's a really good healthy building uh, certification. It is a little bit cost prohibitive just because of how heavy it is into measurement and verification of the indoor environment. Then you also have Fitwell. Fitwell is an interesting program. I've kind of heard it described as well light, which I don't really like that. The only right way that it is well light is, is the cost of it. Fitwell was launched by the CDC and GSA for their pilot program in GSA buildings around the country. So it's, it's backed by the CDC and, and years of research to put this program together. It's now operated by the Center for Active Design. Obviously, you know, we see, I, I've seen, and you know, in my travels to many commercial buildings, uh, they uh, have LEED Platinum, LEED Gold, all of these different certifications, and you know, they, they put it right on that front door. Um, so it's obviously something they're very proud of. Have there been studies that have shown that you know, buildings with these certifications rent for higher dollar per square foot, or is there any advantage to doing that from a business standpoint? Yeah. I mean, you know what, like I said, uh, when I started in my sustainability journey, because of my background, it was always about the energy efficiency. 
are you operating the building efficiently? There are definitely studies and, you know, just, just for instance, between 2015 and 2018, the cost effectiveness of LEED certified buildings had $1.2 billion in energy savings, $149.5 million in water savings, $715.3 million in maintenance savings, and then another $54.2 million in waste savings. So, you know, that, that's a pretty strong business case on the financial side. But as I started getting more engulfed in the sustainability world and working with it, you know, I, I also kind of look at it, the ownership is looking at the financial case of it, but you're able to save all this money while doing something good to uh, save and restore our planet. That's another strong business case for it too. So for our building engineers who are listening out there who may be interested in, in just getting started, I know you mentioned the Energy Star was you know, Energy Star certification is probably a good place to start. And uh, certainly we'll link to a lot of the resources that you need to, to get to these uh, different certifications. As far as, let's say, low-hanging fruit goes for these building engineers, where would you recommend they get started um, looking for opportunities to make their buildings more healthy and sustainable? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, like you said, Energy Star is a really great low-budget but that's not going to really identify, like you said, the low hanging fruit. So if, 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 you know, the operator's budget, facility budget allows the, the really the best thing to do on energy, you know, ASHRAE calls them energy audits. I don't like the audit word because it kind of has a negative connotation. So I, I like to call them energy assessments, you know, and there's, there's the three different levels of energy assessments, one, two, and three. One is, it's kind of, you know, just like a, a cursory overview, a 30,000 foot overview of how the facility is operating. A level two is a little bit more in depth and involves a site visit. And then a, at the end, a, a report is produced. And then the third gets a little more intensive where it's going to identify capital improvement projects that the ownership can undertake to become more energy efficient. So for, for my recommendations, it would, would be to start with an energy assessment. And I'll tell you, one of the hesitations I've heard about getting energy assessments is essentially it provides you with a list of things to do. But Obviously, there's, you know, there's varying levels of recommendations where it's all, all the way from DIY to capital budget project. Do you think that there's enough there on the self-performing side to justify the cost, uh, you know, with that alone? Yeah, definitely. I mean, an energy assessment, even a, a level two or level three, it's not only going to identify energy efficiency opportunities, but... You know, a good energy assessor is going to give you a detailed report at the end and kind of put a dollar amount to it so that you can take it to your ownership or management, your property manager and say, you know, these are the things that we're going to need to do to implement to get where we need to be. And here, here's the cost savings associated with the return on investment for refitting the entire building with LEDs or going through and changing out the flushometers or changing out the aerators. So, yeah, there, there's definitely, you know, it, it can be cost prohibitive. And unfortunately, a lot of times what we see is somebody will engage a consultant to to do an energy assessment and then never do anything with it. Yeah, right. That's you. You get all these lists of recommendations and uh, they they gather dust. It doesn't do you a whole lot of good if uh, if you're not planning on taking action on those things. So, uh, I guess that's something for building engineers who are considering doing an energy assessment. It seems logical enough, but uh, make sure beyond what you've budgeted for that assessment that you either have the bandwidth in house or uh, potentially the budget to deploy some of those recommendations. Right. Exactly, exactly. And there's there's a lot of different, one of the biggest challenges of after energy assessment is done is the money behind it. But there's there's so many different companies out there that provide financial assistance at low or no cost to the ownership to get these types of energy upgrades done. And then there's also a ton of rebates out there. Check with your local utility company and see that there may be rebates available for lighting upgrades or for other type of utility upgrades. Absolutely. That's a great point. Uh, we have a podcast that we did a while back on the CPACE program and uh, we also covered a few other national energy incentives. But uh, beyond that, there, there are state incentives out there. There are utility companies who are offering incentives as well. So when you think, well, this is out of my budget, that's something to go check out. We'll, uh, we'll try to link you to a few of those resources in our uh, podcast here as well. Yeah, definitely. We also partner with a good energy financing company to provide stuff like that. So that's I'm also available for resource for that. Yeah, absolutely. And that's something to take advantage of. We understand how much legwork can go into researching those things and trying to figure out whether or not they're viable for your particular situation. There are companies out there that specialize in that. So 
don't feel like you have to do it alone. You know, reach out and uh, start a conversation and see what they can do for you. Yeah. Yeah. One, one other thing I wanted to bring up, you know, all these different certifications, a lot of conversations I have, obviously, you know, sometimes it's depending on the size of the project, they can be really, really cost prohibitive just because of the certification costs and the consulting fee. So, you know, a, a lot of people say, well, we're running the building efficiently. We're running it per lead guidelines. I always like to say, you know, that's kind of like going to college for four years and then not showing up for your final exams that fourth year. So you, you have all the knowledge behind it, but you don't actually have the degree. Right. That's a great comparison. Um, so, Greg, I mean, uh, that's really all the questions that I have for you today. Uh, I kind of open the floor to you. Anything in particular on the topic of the business case for healthy, sustainable buildings that we didn't cover here? No, I think we ran a, a pretty good gamut of, of all the topics. At, at the very least, it, do something, you know, do something to make your building better, more energy efficient, healthier. Like, like you said, you know, the low hanging fruit are always there and a good building operator, good facility manager is always going to be able to identify those and run the building efficiently. Well, great. Uh, thank you again to Gregory Patton for joining the uh, podcast today. Greg, uh, you're certainly welcome back anytime. Really appreciate you joining us. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for your time today. All right. Thank you all for listening. This is Scott Holstein for the Building Technology Podcast signing off.